taking your prayers. Come, Father. Feel. Feel our hearts. Feel this breath, please. Thank you, Father. We love you, Lord. We love you, Abba.
Hey gang, welcome to Sunday morning. I am so glad that you've decided to be with us today. You know, it's an honor to have you worship with us because guess what? We know that you've got a lot of choices that you could make on Sunday morning and we're thankful that you've decided to be with us today. And if this is your very first time with us, let me say thanks. My name is Joe Glines. I'm the pastor here and we're a brand new church starting up here in southwestern Broward County right in the middle of this pandemic. You know, some people, uh, some, more than some, many say that we're crazy, but you know, it's been a great decision. It absolutely has been wonderful. We have seen growth during this period of time and, and we're hope, and we hope that you can come and you can join us in, in your journey with Jesus. Listen, if, if you don't know anything about him, that's great. That's not a problem. If you know a lot about him, but you've been away, that's okay, not a problem. We, we just want you to come and be with us. See, we want to be your church, your friends, and your family, and we just exist just to do one thing. Uh, we want to joyfully and passionately glorify God as we proclaim the supremacy of Jesus and as we edify you. So if you come to the Redeemer's place, I think you're going to find a, a group of great people who come from all walks of life and they come from different cultures and ethnicities and age groups. We're as diverse as our community. It's a blessing to be here and we rejoice in that. You see, we're, we're people just like you. Uh, we're just seeking to grow in our walk with Jesus. We just want to know Him more. We, we want to grow in our faith. So let me encourage you, just come and join us. And I think you'll enjoy your walk with Jesus as you join this great group of people. And I think you're going to be blessed. You know, why don't we do this? Uh, before we actually jump into God's Word today, uh, I want to spend a few minutes. I want to pray because we're, we're going to talk about a critical subject today. And, and I want to just ask the Lord to bless His, His time with us and to, to just work through what we're about to talk about. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of, of coming and talking to you about uh, the joy in, in Jesus. We're, we're so thankful, Lord, that Paul has given us this great book to study and to walk away from and to contemplate and to meditate upon because joy is such a, a critical commodity that we need in our lives. And so, Lord, today, in the midst of all the craziness that's going on in the world, um, we ask that your joy would be ever-present in our lives, and we pray that your Son would be ever-present in our lives. We, we're so thankful for the privilege of knowing Him, and we ask that as we walk with Him, that His joy would become more evident in our hearts and our minds and our lives every single day. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, I want to ask you something. I want to ask you, what do you think when you hear about the word stability? The word stability, what do you think about? You know, given the circumstances of our society, you may think of the need for mental or emotional stability. You know, the ability to not go off kilter, to not go crazy just because the events of life are crazy and nuts today. You, you may say it's the, the ability to maintain a, a balanced and an objective outlook on the circumstances of life or the ability to act and to react in appropriate ways that, that really foster goodness in our society. You know, whatever you think there, we, we inherently know that what's going on today is, is, is exactly that. It's not stable. Or, or maybe you think about a building's foundation that gives the overall uh, edifice this necessary stability to withstand the onslaught of nature. You know, the example that is really prevalent for our community is that since Hurricane Andrew hit South Florida in the 1990s, all of the building codes have been significantly upgraded to ensure stability of all new construction so that it can withstand the strongest winds of any hurricane. Stability gives strength in the face of challenges and the storms of life. The truth is that those examples, they could go on and on and on, but when we think about stability, there's always 
something inherent in the dis definition. It, it, it's so that the ultimate objective of the person, it, it's so that the building or the organization can be achieved in the face of challenges and difficulty. Stability gives sustaining power and present despite what may be occurring. You know, for the home, it's the stability of the foundation that ensures that it can withstand the storm. For the person, it's the stability of their mind that helps them navigate the circumstances of life. And for the organization, it's the, the ability to achieve its objectives despite the challenges it faces in the business world or the community. You see, stability always has a purpose. It always has a purpose. Stability always has a goal. Stability always has an object, objective. And you know what? Mankind is always looking for stability in his life. Always. It's always something that we all do. And you know what? It's the same with spiritual stability. It has an objective and a purpose. It's to ensure that we're able to live joyfully for Jesus as, as individuals and by default, so that our church is able to achieve its ultimate objective of, of joyfully and passionately glorifying God as we proclaim the supremacy of Jesus and edify His people. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at verses 1 through 9 of chapter 4 of Philippians, and here's what I want you to remember. And here's the, the one key lesson I want you to take away that you can you know, hang on the bathroom mirror and meditate on this week. It's this. Joyful stability in Jesus is the secret to impacting our world for Him. Let me say that again. Joyful stability in Jesus, it is the secret to impacting our world for Him. Now, I want you to notice how Paul says that in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 4. Listen to what he says. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for... My joy and crown stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Synthiki to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. May God bless the reading of His Word. Now, did you notice how Paul begins verse 1? You know, he gives the Philippians what I'm going to call a spiritual sandwich. You know, he gives them words of encouragement first. And then he gives them the meat of a command second. And then he finishes up with words of encouragement again. And, you know, it's just like a ham sandwich. He expresses his love and his joy for them first. He says, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown. And then he reminds them again of his love for them by ending verse, word, verse 1 with these words, my beloved. So on, on either end of this command, he's, he's come to them and he's expressed his joy and his love for them. You see, the, you get the sense that, that Paul is, is treating himself like their spiritual father and, and he is going to say something to them, to them that they, they may like or they may not like, but he's going to do it in love. After all, he says they are his joy and crown, or literally they were like a garland wreath that was worn by a victor after a race. 
You see, he loved them. He had worked hard for them. He had discipled them. He had encouraged them. And now he's going to, to remind them of the need to stand fast in their joy. You see, it, it's, it's the meat and the sandwich that he gives them. Stand firm thus in the Lord. You know, that, that's a great command. And what he's saying to the Philippians is, listen up, Philippians, you know, you have got to stand firm in Jesus. Uh, don't give in to those false teachers that I've been warning you about. And to help you remain joyfully steadfast in your faith, I'm giving you this command, and now I'm going to show you how to stand firm in the Lord with joy. And you know, that simple verse, that one single verse, it gives us our, our first key takeaway today, and it's this. Stable, steadfast joy in Jesus is founded upon love. Let me say that again. It's so, it's so simple, but it's so profound. Stable, steadfast joy in Jesus is founded upon love. You know, Paul's love for this pe these people, it just kind of oozes off the pages through everything that he says. You know, he's about to give them a, a really, really, really hard lesson. But he wants them to know that this lesson, it is founded upon his love for them. He wants to, them to know that what he's about to do is for the best for them. You see, the definition of agape love, that, that selfless, that sacrificial love that Jesus and all of the writers of the New Testament call us to, is doing what is best for the other person regardless of the cost to us. It's a love that is focused on the benefit of the other person. It's not this idea of a weak or a flimsy love that, that lets almost anything go. It's, it's actually a verb. It, it's action-oriented. It's not passive. And, and for example, when encouragement is called for, guess what? encouragement's given. When, when help is called for, guess what? Help is given. And when discipline is called for, it's done in love. But think about what happens when correction or, or when discipline isn't done in love. You know, it can be harsh and, and unbending, and it rarely accomplishes the objectives of a change course of, of life. And if you want an example of that, you can see it played out in real life uh, just try to discipline this little guy that you see on the screen after he's stolen a cookie from his big sister. This is my grandson, James. A and he is every bit boy, despite all those cute curls that all the girls oogle and ogle over. He is a wonderful, fabulous kid. He is all boy, as I said, but he is known to be a little bit mischievous at times. He is a loving agitator of his older sister, and he knows exactly what he's doing to get her goat. And he has no problem marshalling his forces against her on a frequent basis. But his nana, that's my wife Kathy, his grandmother has James all figured out. The only way for her to effectively discipline James is through love. Try to use any other avenue, and guess what? It's going to result in an obstinate and a difficult little boy. But with James, love works miracles. And that is just what his nana does every single time that she has to discipline him. And, and you know, Paul, he realizes that same exact principle. So he sets this foundation of love first before he instructs the Philippians on how to exhibit steadfast joy in Jesus. Man, oh man, if we could only learn that in this country, we would be so much better off in life. And you know what? That leads us to our second key lesson on achieving this, this steadfast, stable joy in Jesus. And it's found in verses 2 and 3, and it's this. That steadfast joy in Jesus demands harmony among the saints. Let me say that again. Steadfast joy in Jesus demands harmony among the saints. I want you to look at verses 2 and 3 and, and notice what, what's going on here. 
You know, there are two women in the church, Euodia and Syntyche, and they're just having what we would call a good old-fashioned church fight. And Paul gives us a hint about the cause of the fight. Because the word agree in the Greek literally means to think the same thing. So you see, these two women, they're not seeing eye to eye on some mundane issue in the church. They're not agreeing on something that, that has come up in the church. They have this different difference of opinion. Maybe it's on the color of the carpet or on the, on the color of the drapes or the walls. Maybe they're disagreeing over who should lead the next church fellowship. Maybe in the heat of ministry, one of them has said a cross word to the other, and now they're squabbling like two little girls on the playground. But whatever the issue is, we know. We know that it's not a core doctrinal issue. Because Paul mentions that they have labored side by side with Paul for the gospel, that their names are recorded in the book of life. These are good, solid Christian women who know Jesus, who love Jesus, who have worked side by side with one another, who have literally labored alongside or who have fought alongside with Paul and the others that are in the church at Philippi. Uh, they've all been all about Jesus. And they are key to the success of their church. But you know what? They've lowered their sights to their own personal wishes instead of keeping their eyes on the author and the perfecter of their faith that the writer of the Hebrews tells us about in Hebrews chapter 12. But you know what's compounding this conflict even more is that it appears that the church leadership is letting this little, little battle uh, fester and, and just grow. Nobody is confronting it. Nobody is dealing with it. And if there was ever a way to destroy the joy in the church, if there was ever a way to destroy stability in a church and open the door for false teachers to reign and sink their steadfastness in Jesus, it is through not addressing conflict in the church. And so what, what does Paul do? Paul does something amazing. He reminds the, the leadership, uh, along with a person named Clement and the entire rest of the church, to, to work with these ladies to resolve the conflict. You see, he's reminding them that it is everybody's responsibility to guard their unity and their steadfastness in their joy for the Lord. It's not just the pastor's responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility to guard the church by remaining steadfast one to another and to our Lord and to guard our hearts and minds towards each other. And it's the leader's role in the church to see that issues in the church are addressed in a timely manner so that they don't get out of hand and they destroy the church's testimony to its joy in the Lord. Man, what an amazing few verses, just verses 2 and 3, and, and we've already come up with all of this. And you know, I would say this to us at the Redeemer's Place, I praise the Lord for our love and our unity for Jesus and for each other. I, I hope you know how precious that is, how unique that is. And despite all the amazing diversity of our body, we are one with Jesus and one another. Gang, that is so powerful. That is so amazing. That is so critical to our testimony. It is so appealing to the world that we've got to guard our unity and joy in Jesus and with each other. You see, we must stand firm thus in the Lord, as Paul tells the Philippians. So, so let us joyfully and let us passionately glorify God for this blessing. Let us be known as a church that's sacrificial in our love for each other and for Jesus. And guess what? Because we're so diverse, there are going to be issues that come up. But if we have issues with, uh, with one another, let's deal with them openly and honestly with each other. Let's use Matthew 18 as our guide. You know, if we have an issue with someone, guess what? We go to that person. We don't gossip about the issue in the, with the rest of the body of the church. That's, a, that's, that's the quickest way 
to destroy a church. And if that doesn't work, then we take eyewitnesses with us. And notice I say eyewitnesses, not third-party people that have no uh, first-hand knowledge of what's going on. But take somebody with you and deal with it that way. And then if that doesn't come about to rectify the situation, then we bring it to the leadership of the church to be resol resolved. But we have to maintain our unity because it is a testimony to the world about Jesus. And, you know, we've got to remember that our testimony to our community about Jesus, it comes by maintaining a steadfast joy through our harmony with one another. Amen? Amen. But now, do me a favor. I, I want you to look at verses 4 through 9. And I want you to notice what Paul says. I, I want to read them again because this section of Scripture is not only one of my most favorite sections, but it's also one of the most important in all of the New Testament. Listen to what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Did you notice something about Paul's words and these, these few short verses. Everything he deals, he says to the Philippians, it, it deals explicitly with their character. Did you notice that? It all deals with their character. Everything he says talks about the power source for steadfast joy, for the ability to rejoice in the Lord always, because it, it all deals with our adherence to Christian values and virtues. In fact, Paul's commands to rejoice, it's in the present tense, implying that our rejoicing, it is to be an ever-present reality in our lives, despite all the craziness that we face. You know, that echoes James. In James chapter 1, verse 2, when he says, Consider it all joy, meaning... We are to, to be joyful in the face of the good and the bad and the ugly in our lives. And all of that is to be overcome by, by continuously rejoicing because we know that God is sovereign and that He is in control and He is doing what is the very best for us. And that leads us to our final key lesson in joyful, in joyful stability for Jesus, and it's this. That maintaining steadfast joy requires living out Christian virtues. Let me say that again. Maintaining steadfast joy requires living out Christian virtues. Look at what Paul tells them. They are to be reasonable to all. Uh, that means to Christian and non-Christian alike, by the way. Uh, they are, they are, there's no better witness than when all hell is breaking loose in life. Uh, that than when we are cool and when we're calm and we're collected in our conduct. When our graciousness is evident to everyone, it is a powerful unifier in the church and it's a powerful testimony to Jesus. But then he reminds them to not be anxious. And why is that? Well, well it's simple. You see, he says, God is near. Uh, did you know that? He, he's right here with us. His desire is to, to meet our needs. His desire is to comfort our souls. His desire is to rest our minds. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew, 28, uh, Matthew 11, verse 28. He said this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. 
What a tremendous verse. What, what a tremendous promise from Jesus. Because you see, there is no way for us to figure out all the complexities of life or to bear under the burdens of everything that life is throwing at us. But guess what? He can. He can bear it all. And Paul gives us the avenue. He says to bring everything to God in prayer with thanksgiving. In other words, don't, don't grumble about it. Know that the circumstances of our lives, they're, they're ordained by God from His hand. Just let Him handle it. And here's what's even ama more amazing when we do just that. That step of faith comes with a promise. The peace of God. Of God. It will guard our hearts and our minds. He will guard our emotions. He's going to guard our will, our intellect, our physical well-being. He's going to guard us completely. And on the surface, you know what? That doesn't make sense on the surface. Because His peace passes all understanding. But when we realize that He has everything under His control, we can be steadfast in our joy for Jesus despite all the circumstances of life. But you know, Paul ends with this command. He says that we are to dwell upon seven critical virtues. He says these things um, are things that we are to literally evaluate and to consider or literally to calculate. And you see, steadfast joy in Jesus requires an active mind and an active intellect to harness our understanding under God's wisdom. In other words, our walk with Jesus is not to be an anti-intellectual or an anti-critical thinking activity. Uh, Paul's charge here is to do exactly the opposite, to put your mind to work so that you achieve steadfast joy by, by living out these seven Christian virtues. Remember what God said to rebellious Israel in Isaiah 1.18. Come now and let us reason together. And, and I want us to remember also what John Stott said. He's that great English Anglican priest. He said this in his book, Your Mind Matters. Indeed. Sin has more dangerous effects on our facility of feeling than on our facility of thinking because our opinions are more easily checked and regulate, regulated by revealed truth than our experiences. You know, I, I think that John Stott had it right because he understood what Paul is telling the Philippians. They are to meditate on the truth found in God's Word. Uh, remember that Jesus said in John 17, 17, in his high priestly prayer to the Father, he says, your word is truth. And let's remember what Paul, what he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, he says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You see, if we want to be equipped to joyfully stand fast with Jesus and with each other, our adherence to God's truth is critical in our lives. And that's why our first core value as a church is that we, we value living biblical truth. And you see, without truth, the rest of the Christian virtues mentioned, they just don't come to fruition in our lives. Paul says that we are to to live honorably and justly and purely. Our lives are to be lived out in view of heaven with this, this standard of righteousness that models Jesus. People should see and sense and, and feel Jesus through us because we are upright and a godly people. Notice I didn't say starchy. Notice I didn't say the frozen chosen, but we should be people who are known for our values and that our values are aligned with God's values. But you know, Paul goes on to say that we are to exhibit love, a, a sense of excellence, and praise in our life. You know, the word love here is, is best translated sweet or, or gracious or generous or patient. 
And the word excellence implies that which is highly regarded or, or, or highly thought of. In other words, the characteristic of our life should, should be like a walking testimony for all to see that, that reveals our love for Jesus and our attractiveness towards mankind and God. Uh, this is not a life that, that is focused on the mundane or the trivial things of life. Instead, it's a steadfast life that is full of praise. It is full of joy because we understand our purpose. And it's for us at the Redeemer's place, it is to joyfully and passionately glorify God as we proclaim the supremacy of Jesus and we edify His people. In fact, did you notice that, that Paul tells the Philippians that they are to practice these things? He's telling them that, that they've got to be like this great athlete who, who practices his, his sport repeatedly so that his reflexes and his movements become second nature. You know, Kathy and I are taking a self-defense course, and we're learning all of these boxing moves and everything, and my reflexes are not up to speed. And so, but what Paul is telling them is that their reflexes in their life, their spiritual reflexes have got to be just like Jesus. And you know what? This, this activity, this, this uh, practice of these virtues, it, it's not a one-time activity in life. Uh, they're to live these virtues day in and day out so that they become second nature to them. And when that happens... That can maintain steadfast joy through living out these Christian virtues. And then, and then this joyful stability in Jesus will impact our world for Jesus. You know, as we get ready to close today, I've got a story to tell you. Uh, most Americans were familiar with the phrase that Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of, the in, of Independence, that all Americans have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, we think of that saying, it's, it's so American, it's, it's like apple pie. But the truth is this, that Thomas Jefferson stole that phrase from ancient Greek philosophers. Some say it came from Aristotle, others say that it came from Cicero, but regardless of, of who the original author was, the Greeks had a meaning for happiness that's different than we have the meaning for happiness. By the word happiness, they meant virtues. They meant virtues. For the Greek, the pathway to happiness and joy was through living the virtues that were good for mankind. It was those virtues that were espoused by the Greek philosophers that they felt were key to a good life. So Paul here, he's echoing the same exact sentiment to the Philippians with except with one caveat. The virtues he calls us to, they are the virtues of Jesus, not mankind. They are virtues of the Almighty God. He calls us to the truth found in God's Word. He tells us that we are to live like Jesus. We are to practice honor and justice and purity. We are to practice love and excellence and praise. And when we do that, our steadfast joy will impact our world for Jesus. We will be like that light of a city on a hill. We will be the salt that makes the world thirsty for Jesus. We will see Jesus transform our community and our families and our places of employment and our neighborhoods for Jesus because He has transformed us. You see, if we want change where we're planted, the change has got to start with us. So here's the question for us as we get ready to apply what we've heard today. Uh, what are we going to do with what we now know? I mean, how are we going to expand the scope of joy in our lives? How are we going to grow in our steadfast joy with Jesus this week? You know, maybe we just need to pick one thing and start a habit this week. And maybe it's honor or, or justice or purity. Maybe it's a focus on, on God's Word as truth. Maybe it's love or excellence or praise. Or maybe there's someone in our life Maybe there's someone in our life we need to go to 
and try to restore the harmony between us. Maybe have a cup of coffee with them and, and talk things over. Maybe seek to be Jesus in the midst of the hurt and the challenges that life just naturally brings through relationships. But whatever it is, let's allow God's Holy Spirit to do His work in us this week. Let's not leave here just listening but never doing. Uh, that, that's a recipe for disaster because we're called to exhibit steadfast joy in Jesus so that the world sees Him through us. And with that, I think God's people can say amen. Well, gang, listen, I want to say thank you for, for being with us through our, our sermon and our worship time today. But if you're new with us today, you should know that we also worship the Lord through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Um, that's one of our core values. And, and we want to just worship Him as we give back to Him a little of that which He has given to us. And, and we offer three ways in which you can do that. First, you could write a check and make it out to the Redeemer's Place and mail it to 3859 Oak Ridge Circle, Weston, Florida, 33331. Um, and we'll get it and, and we'll take care of everything from there. But if you want to do it online, you can go to our website, theredeemersplace.com. Just find the little Give button. Just click on that. Grab your credit card. Follow the directions. It'll be great. And then third, a great way to do it is with your cell phone. You can go to your texting feature. And in the two line, put in this number, 77977. Again, 77977. And in the message area, put in two words, all in capital letters, no punctuation, Redeemer's Place. Again, all caps, no punctuation, two words, Redeemer's Place, hit send, follow the directions. You'll need a credit card uh, to complete that transaction. But listen, gang, I praise the Lord for you every single week. I am amazed at what you're doing. I am so thankful for your generosity to the Redeemer's Place. You are helping us literally plan for the future. So praise God for your generosity. I'm so thankful. And you know, if we get ready to close, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to join us on Wednesday night for our Bible study. We're going through 1 Peter. It is a great time in God's Word. We just look at it verse by verse. And, and I think you'll enjoy that as we go through that. But join us on Wednesday night for that. Also on Friday nights at 7 p.m., we meet for a time of prayer and, and fellowship. It's outdoors at a local park. It's at Library Park at 4499 Bonaventure Boulevard in Weston, Florida, 33332. We meet at 7 o'clock. We're there for just about an hour. We just have some prayer time. We have some fellowship. But it's a great time for us uh, to just get to know each other. And if you're, if you're um, one of our ladies and, and you would like to get tied in with our women's Bible study, they do that on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. Just drop me a note at info at the Redeemer's Place and we'll get you uh, all set with that as well. We also have a men's breakfast one time a month. Men, if you're interested in just some good fellowship, some good food, it's very low key. Drop me a note at info at theredeemersplace.com and we'll make sure you get tied in there as well. And then finally, I want you to look for our announcement on when we're going to be coming back together. I know it's been so long. I know it's a frustration. I know we, we miss each other, but we're making plans to get back together. I've said that every week and we still are planning that way. So I pray that, that we're going to be able to do that very soon, but keep a watch out for that as well. But thank you, gang, for worshiping with us. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's our joy and our honor to go to the Lord and worship with you today. God bless and have a great week. Amen.